I never thought I'd feel jealous watching someone else's mom make dinner, but there I was, frozen in Tessa's kitchen doorway, watching Mrs. Monroe teach her daughter how to properly dice an onion. The way she guided Tessa's hands, laughing at her daughter's exaggerated tears from the fumes, it hit me like a punch to the gut. My name's Lila, and I've spent 18 years pretending I was fine with how things were in my family. But something about that simple moment between Tessa and her mom cracked something open inside me that I couldn't close again. You're holding the knife too flat, honey, Mrs. Monroe said, adjusting Tessa's grip. There you go. Now you won't slice your fingers off. She kissed the top of Tessa's head and I had to look away. Earth to Lila, Tessa called out. You gonna help us with this curry or just stand there looking tragic? I forced a smile and stepped into their warm, chaotic kitchen. Counter was covered in half-chopped vegetables, and something aromatic simmered on the stove. It was so different from my house, where takeout containers and pristine and used appliances ruled the kitchen. Sorry, just zoned out for a second, I said, grabbing a knife. What do you need me to do? Mrs. Monroe handed me a pile of bell peppers. These need to be julienne, that means thin strips, sweetie. And tell me how that college application process is going. Your mother mentioned you were looking at state. I focused on the pepper, carefully removing the seeds. Actually, I'm thinking about taking a gap year. Maybe work for a while, figure things out. I waited for the lecture about wasting potential, the one my parents had already given me twice this week. Instead, Mrs. Monroe just nodded. That's perfectly reasonable. Sometimes we need time to find our path. She squeezed my shoulder as she passed, and I nearly cut myself from the unexpected gesture. My phone buzzed, probably my mother reminding me about dinner. I've been avoiding going home lately, making excuses to stay at Tessa's or the library. Anything to dodge another silent meal where the only sounds were forks scraping plates and my father's occasional comments about his dental practice. Stay for dinner? Tessa asked, reading my mind as usual. Mom always makes too much anyway. Before I could answer, my phone buzzed again. This time it was a text from my father. Family meeting tonight? Mandatory. 7 p.m. sharp. Can't, I said, showing Tessa the text. Apparently, we're having a family meeting. Ooh, sounds serious, Tessa waggled her eyebrows. Maybe they're finally getting you that pony you asked for when you were seven. I forced a laugh, but something felt off. My parents didn't do family meetings. They did carefully scheduled appointments and efficiently managed conversations, usually about my academic performance or career trajectory. I should head out, I said, washing my hands. Thanks for letting me help with dinner, Mrs. Monroe. Anytime, sweetheart. You're always welcome here. She gave me a quick hug and I had to blink back sudden tears. The walk home felt longer than usual. Our house stood dark and imposing against the evening sky, every window dark except for my father's study. Through the glass, I could see him on the phone, pacing with that focused expression he got when closing a deal or planning an investment. My mother's car wasn't in the driveway yet, but her text had confirmed she'd be home for the meeting. Whatever this was about, it was big enough to disrupt her usual late nights at the office. I stood at the bottom of our perfect stone walkway, looking up at our perfect house with its perfect landscaping, and felt something shift inside me. Whatever was coming, whatever this meeting was about, I had a feeling it would change everything. Taking a deep breath, I started up the path, the smell of Tessa's family's curry still clinging to my clothes, a reminder of everything I didn't have waiting for me behind that heavy front door. The family meeting turned out to be more of an execution, just with expensive wine instead of a last meal. My parents sat across from me at our formal dining table, their faces wearing the same expression they used when firing household staff. We're moving to Switzerland, my father announced, swirling his wine like this was a casual dinner conversation. I've accepted a position with an international dental consortium. Your mother will be heading their PR department. I waited for the rest, the part about my college plans, about where I'd be living. The silence stretched until I realized they weren't going to say it. I had to ask. When do we leave? 
My mother's perfectly manicured fingers tapped against her wine glass. We leave in three weeks. You, however, will not be joining us. The words hit like ice water. What? You're 18 now, Lila, my father said, his tone practical. Old enough to start building your own life. We've arranged for your trust fund to become accessible. And there's enough there for a modest apartment and living expenses while you attend university. I stared at my mother, searching for any hint of emotion. She met my gaze with the same detached interest she showed during charity galas. This is an opportunity for you to develop independence, she said. We've provided everything you need to succeed. Everything except parents who gave a damn. When were you planning to tell me? Or was this meeting my notice to vacate? My voice came out steadier than I felt. Don't be dramatic, my father sighed. We're giving you three weeks to make arrangements. That's more than generous. I pushed back from the table, my chair scraping against the hardwood. Right. Generous. Like abandoning your kid is some kind of gift. We're not abandoning you, my mother's voice sharpened. We're treating you like the adult you are. Many young people would be grateful for this level of financial support. I laughed, the sound harsh in our too perfect dining room. Yeah, I'm sure lots of kids dream of being bought off so their parents can start a new life without them. Moving toward the stairs, I heard my father call out, Where are you going? We haven't finished discussing the arrangements. I'm going to pack, I shot back. Wouldn't want to waste any of your generous three-week notice. In my room, I grabbed my laptop and started searching for apartments, my vision blurring. A notification popped up. An email from my mother, already forwarding contact information for realtors and financial advisors. Of course. They'd probably had this planned for months. My phone buzzed with a text from Tessa. How was the family meeting? Everything okay? Before I could respond, I noticed an envelope that had fallen from my mother's home office while I was storming upstairs. The address caught my eye. It was to my Aunt Marge, my mother's estranged sister who we never discussed. The letter was unsealed. I knew I shouldn't read it, but at this point, what more could they do to me? The contents made my hands shake. Marjorie, I know you'll never forgive me for what happened with David. I live with that choice every day. But now that Graham and I are leaving, I need you to watch over Lila. She has too much of him in her, that same softness that made David so vulnerable. I can't protect her from that anymore. Who was David? And what choice was my mother living with? A knock at my door made me shove the letter under my pillow. My father stood there, holding a folder. These are the documents you'll need, he said, placing them on my desk. The realtor can show you properties starting tomorrow. I looked at him, really looked at him, and saw something I'd never noticed before. Fear. But of what? Dad, I started, but he was already turning away. Get some rest, Lila. You have a lot to arrange in the next few weeks. I sat on my bed, the mysterious letter burning under my pillow, my phone buzzing with Tessa's concerned messages, and realized I had two choices. I could do what I'd always done, follow their plans, be the perfect daughter even in abandonment, or I could finally start asking the questions they never wanted me to ask. Starting with finding out who David was and what my mother had done to him. The Moonlight Cafe wasn't my first choice for a job. But beggars can't be choosers when they're racing against a three-week deadline to build an independent life. Leo Hargrove, the owner, hired me on the spot, his smile a little too warm as he showed me around the kitchen. Such a shame about your parents, he said, demonstrating how to work the espresso machine. I near mother back in high school. She was. Different then. The way he said different made me look up sharply, but his expression gave nothing away. Everyone in this town seemed to have secrets about my family except me. Different how? I asked, trying to sound casual while steaming milk. Leo shrugged, but his eyes held mine a moment too long. People change. Sometimes for good reasons. He glanced at the clock. Take your break. We should talk about your situation. 
In his office, Leo leaned back in his chair, studying me. You know, I have an apartment above the cafe. Previous manager lived there. It's sitting empty now. My heart jumped. The real estate agent had shown me nothing but overpriced dumps all week. Really? Could be yours. Reduced rent for an employee, of course. He smiled that too warm smile again. We'd need to work out some. Arrangements. Something in his tone made my skin crawl. What kind of arrangements? Nothing unreasonable. Extra shifts, helping with books, keeping me company during late nights. He reached across the desk, his fingers brushing my hand. I could be very generous to the right person. I jerked back, nearly knocking over my chair. I should get back to work. Don't be hasty, Lila. You're in a tough spot. I'm offering help. His voice hardened slightly. Your mother would understand. She made similar choices when she was young. The implications hit me like a slap. What exactly do you know about my mother? Enough to know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He stood, moving around the desk. Think about it. The offer stands. For now. I back toward the door. I quit. You're just like him, Leo called after me as I fled. David never could see an opportunity when it was right in front of him either. I froze. David? But Leo just smiled and turned away, leaving me with another piece of the puzzle I couldn't quite fit. Sighed, I slumped against the building, hands shaking as I pulled out my phone and the crumpled letter from my pocket. Two mentions of David in two days after 18 years of never hearing the name. I googled David Caldwell plus our town name. The first result made my blood run cold. Local teen's disappearance remains unsolved after 20 years. The grainy photo showed a boy around my age. With a familiar smile that hit me like a punch to the gut. My phone buzzed, a text from my mother. The realtor said you haven't chosen an apartment yet. Time is running out. Another buzz. Stay away from Leo Hargrove. I stared at the second message, anger and confusion burning in my throat. Now she wanted to protect me? After arranging to abandon me in the same town where her nephew had vanished? My fingers moved before I could think better of it, typing in Aunt Marge's address from the letter. It was only a 20-minute drive. Going to be late, I texted my parents. Don't wait up. The response came instantly. Do not contact Marjorie. This isn't up for discussion. But I was done with their discussions, done with their secrets and schemes. If they wouldn't tell me the truth about David, about why they were really leaving town, about what Leo knew, then I'd find someone who would. I got in my car and pulled up directions to Aunt Marge's house, the newspaper article about David still open on my phone. Whatever had happened 20 years ago, whatever choice my mother had made, it was all connected to why they were abandoning me now. And I was going to find out exactly what they were running from. Aunt Marge's house looked exactly like the kind of place someone with secrets would live, all overgrown hedges and peeling paint, with wind chimes that rattled like old bones in the evening breeze. I sat in my car for ten minutes before working up the courage to knock. The door opened before my knuckles could touch it. I wondered when you'd show up. Aunt Marge looked nothing like my mother, where Celeste was all polished edges. Marge was soft curves and faded flannel. You have his eyes. David's. The name slipped out before I could stop it. Something flickered across her face. Come in before the neighbors start talking. God knows they've done enough of that over the years. The inside was cluttered but clean, with mismatched furniture and walls covered in photographs. I stopped at one showing my mother as a teenager, her arm around a smiling boy who could only be David. That was two weeks before. Marge said quietly. Before everything changed. What happened to him? She moved to the kitchen, putting on a kettle. Your mother never told you? My mother never tells me anything. I followed her, watching as she pulled out two chipped mugs. But Leo Hargrove seems to know all about it. The mug slipped from Marge's hands, shattering on the linoleum. You've spoken to Leo? 
he offered me a job, and an apartment, and other things. Marge's face went pale. You stayed away from him? I quit. But he said something about my mother making similar choices when she was young. That bastard, Marge whispered, her hand shaking as she cleaned up the broken ceramic. After all these years, he's still... My phone buzzed, another text from my mother. Come home immediately. We know where you are. They're going to try to stop me from finding out the truth, aren't they? I showed Marge the message. She straightened up, something hardening in her expression. Your mother's been running from the truth for 20 years. But maybe it's time someone finally told it. Before she could continue, headlights swept across the windows. Car door slammed. Marjorie! My mother's voice, sharp as broken glass. Open this door. Marge grabbed my arm. Back door. Go to the garage. There's a box on the top shelf marked David's things. Take it. Read everything. Then you'll understand why they're leaving and why they want you gone too. Marge, please. Go. I'll hold them off. But Lila. Her eyes met mine. Whatever you read, remember, your mother wasn't the only one who made choices that night. We all did. Even David. I slipped out just as the front door burst open. Through the kitchen window, I saw my parents enter, my father looking uncomfortable, my mother radiating cold fury. Where is she? Celeste demanded. Hello, sister. Twenty years since you've crossed my threshold and that's how you greet me. I crept into the garage, finding the box exactly where Marge said it would be. Inside was a stack of newspapers, letters, and a leather-bound journal. The first headline made my blood freeze. Local teen missing after confrontation at Moonlight Cafe. Beneath it was a photo of Leo Hargrove, 20 years younger, being questioned by police. And there, in the background, barely visible my mother, being led away in tears. A noise from the house made me jump. I shoved everything back in the box and slipped out the side door, just as I heard my mother's voice rise. You have no right to tell her anything about that night. She has every right to know why her cousin disappeared, Marge shot back. And why you've been protecting his killer all these years. I nearly dropped the box. Killer? My mother had protected David's killer? As if sensing my thoughts, my phone lit up with one final message from my mother. Whatever you think you know, you don't understand. Come home now or there will be consequences. But standing there in the dark, clutching a box full of 20-year-old secrets, I realized I was done letting them threaten me with consequences. It was time they faced some of their own. I spent the night in Tessa's garage, surrounded by David's box of secrets. The newspapers painted a familiar story. Teenage boy vanishes after late-night argument at local cafe. But David's journal told a different tale, one that made my hands shake as I read. Leo knows about Mom and Uncle Jack, the last entry read. Says he'll tell everyone if I don't keep quiet. But Celeste says she has a plan. My mother had a plan. And hours later, David disappeared. Dawn was breaking when Tessa found me, still reading. Your mom's been calling everyone, she said, sitting beside me. She even called my parents at midnight. Did you know about any of this? I showed her the newspaper clipping about David. Mom and Dad never talk about it. But sometimes when your mom comes up in conversation, they get this look. She trailed off, reading over my shoulder. Wait, Uncle Jack? As in your dad's brother. The one who died in that car accident the year before I was born. I pulled out another letter, this one from David to my mother. Except according to this, he didn't die in an accident. He killed himself after Leo threatened to expose their affair. My phone buzzed, Aunt Marge. Your mother's looking for you. Be careful. Leo's helping her search. Why would she team up with Leo? Tessa asked. If he's the one who because they're both protecting something bigger than David's disappearance. I held up the journal. The last few entries, David was investigating money moving through the cafe. Large deposits, 
always after Uncle Jack's dental practice made withdrawals. Money laundering? Through Dad's practice, too, after Uncle Jack died. David figured it out, threatened to expose everything. I closed the journal, feeling sick. No wonder they're running to Switzerland and leaving me behind as a distraction. Tessa grabbed my arm. Lila, look. Through the garage window, we could see Leo's car crawling past, scanning the street. My phone lit up again, my mother. Whatever David told you in those journals, he was confused. Come home. We can explain everything. How does she know about the journals? Tessa whispered. Because Aunt Marge must have told her what she gave me. I started shoving everything back in the box. Which means... A knock at the garage door made us both jump. Lila. Aunt Marge's voice. I know you're in there. Please, we need to talk. I opened the door cautiously. Marge looked exhausted, her eyes red. I had to tell them what I gave you. They... They have leverage. You mean they threatened you, I said flatly. Like they threatened David? It's complicated. What happened that night? Was my mother involved in David's disappearance? Marge flinched. She was trying to protect him. We all were. But Leo, he had other plans. And now you're all protecting Leo? After what he did, we're protecting you. Marge's voice cracked. Why do you think your mother is leaving you behind? As long as you're here, safe and ignorant, Leo won't. Car door slammed outside. My mother's voice carried through the garage. Marjorie? Is she in there? Marge grabbed my shoulders. Whatever you do, don't confront Leo. He's been watching you since you turned 18. Just like he watched David. Why? What does he want? The same thing he wanted then, someone young and desperate enough to be controlled to keep the operation running while your parents establish the European connection. Another car pulled up Leo's distinctive engine. Marge pressed something into my hand, a key. Storage Unit 23, Cross Creek Facility. Everything David collected is there. The proof he never got to show the police. She pushed me toward the back door. Run. And Lila? I'm sorry. For all of it. As I slipped out into the morning light, I heard Leo's voice. Found her car around the corner. She can't have gone far. They were wrong about one thing. I wasn't running from the truth anymore. I was running toward it, straight to the evidence that would bring down everyone who'd had a hand in destroying David's life. And maybe, finally, give him the justice he deserved. The storage unit door groaned open, revealing stacks of boxes and a musty darkness that made my skin crawl. I'd barely switched on my phone's flashlight when I heard footsteps behind me. I knew you'd come here. My mother's voice, tired and hollow. Just like David did. I spun around. She stood in the doorway, looking smaller somehow, her perfect posture crumbling at the edges. How did you? Marge texted me. She's trying to protect you even if you can't see it. She stepped inside, closing the door behind her. We all were, by covering up his murder? Murder, she laughed, a broken sound. Is that what you think happened? The journal entries, the money laundering, Leo's threats. Leo didn't kill David. She moved to a stack of boxes, running her fingers along one marked evidence. David killed himself, right here in this storage unit. After I convinced him to help us trap Leo, the flashlight beam trembled. What? We thought we were so clever. David would pretend to join Leo's operation, gather evidence, wear a wire. Her voice cracked. But Leo knew. He always knew. He showed David photos of me, of Jack, of all the evidence he had against our family. I said if David went to the police, we'd all go down. So David just... gave up. He left a note saying he couldn't live with either choice, destroying his family or letting Leo win. She pulled something from her pocket, a folded piece of paper, worn at the creases. I found him here. Too late. 
I grabbed the note, my hands shaking as I read David's last words. I'm sorry, Aunt Celeste. I tried to be strong enough. Take care of Mom. That's why you're so cold, I whispered. Why you never? I got your cousin killed by trying to fix things. By thinking I could outsmart someone like Leo. She met my eyes. When I saw you getting closer to him at the cafe, watching him draw you in like he did David, a metallic click cut her off. The storage unit door. Quite the family reunion. Leo's voice made my blood freeze. Though you forgot to invite me. He stood in the doorway, backlit by the hallway fluorescence. Something glinted in his hand. You're not taking her too, my mother stepped between us. Actually, Celeste, I think it's time Lila learned the whole truth. About David, about Jack. He smiled. About what really happened to all that money. Mom, my voice sounded small, even to me. What's he talking about? Tell her, Celeste. Tell her who really suggested using David as bait. Who knew he was unstable, knew he might crack under pressure. That's not, my mother started. Tell her who kept the operation running after David died. Who used her own guilt to build our little empire. He stepped closer. Tell her why you're really running to Switzerland. My mother's shoulders sagged. I had to protect what was left of my family. By working with him. The betrayal burned in my throat. After what he did to David, I did what I had to do. And now? She turned to Leo. Now we're done. The evidence, the accounts, everything David collected, it's all here. Take it. Leave Lila out of this. Leo's laugh echoed off the metal walls. Oh, Feliste. You still think you're in control? He raised the gun. But we both know how this ends. Just like it did with David. The storage unit plunged into darkness as my flashlight died. A shot rang out. Someone screamed, maybe me. When the emergency lights flickered on, my mother lay crumpled against the boxes, red spreading across her designer blouse. Leo was gone along with the box marked evidence. Mom, I pressed my hands against the wound, feeling her blood seep through my fingers. Stay with me. Please. Her eyes focused on something behind me. Run, she whispered. Footsteps approached. Like mother, like daughter, Leo's voice came from the doorway. Always trying to fix things that should stay broken. I turned, seeing the gun aimed at my head, and realized with startling clarity that I finally understood how David felt in his final moments. Sometimes there are no good choices left. The fluorescent lights flickered as Leo's finger tightened on the trigger. My mother's blood was still warm on my hands, and somewhere in the distance, sirens wailed. You won't shoot me, I said, surprising myself with how steady my voice sounded. You need me. Leo's smile didn't reach his eyes. And why's that? Because I'm the only one who knows about the second set of books. The words tumbled out before I could second-guess them. The ones David actually hid. His gun hand wavered slightly. Behind me, I heard my mother's labored breathing. You're bluffing, Leo said, but uncertainty crept into his voice. David never had time to tell you about them? Course not. You scared him into suicide before he could. I stood slowly, positioning myself between Leo and my mother. But he told someone else. Someone you never suspected. A door slammed somewhere in the storage facility. Leo's head jerked toward the sound. You really think David would trust his aunt? I pressed. The sister of the woman having an affair with his uncle? No. He trusted someone his own age. Someone who could wait years to use the information. Tessa, Leo breathed. That's why you two were always at the cafe. I forced a laugh. All those years, watching you, learning your operation. Did you really think I applied for that job by accident? The sirens were closer now. Leo's face twisted with rage and doubt. You're lying, he snarled, but his eyes darted to the door again. Maybe. But can you risk it? Police are coming. 
if those books surface, I took a step forward. How many people did you really kill, Leo? David wasn't the first, was he? Shut up. The gun shook in his hand. Or was it all just manipulation? Making people think death was their only escape? Another step. Like you tried with me? I said shut. The storage unit door burst open. Aunt Marge stood there, holding something that made Leo's face go white. Looking for this? She held up a USB drive. David gave it to me the night he died. Said if anything happened to him, I should keep it safe until Lila was old enough. That's impossible, Leo whispered. You weren't even. In town that night? Marge's laugh was bitter. I was. Celeste called me worried about David. I got here too late to save him, but not too late to find what he left behind. Leo swung the gun toward Marge. I lunged, grabbing his arm. The shot went wide, sparking off metal walls. We grappled for the weapon as Marge shouted something I couldn't hear over the blood pounding in my ears. His finger found the trigger again. I twisted, remembering a self-defense move Tessa's dad had taught us years ago. The gun went off. Leo staggered back, a look of surprise crossing his face as red bloomed across his chest. He fell, the gun clattering away. Lila, my mother's voice, weak but urgent. The box? Under the tarps? I scrambled to where she pointed. Under dusty tarps lay a metal box, its lid covered in familiar handwriting David's. He knew, my mother whispered as I opened it. Knew what would happen. Left everything we'd need. Inside were files, photos, USB drives, two decades of evidence against not just Leo but everyone involved in his operation. And on top, a letter addressed to me. Dear Lila, it began. If you're reading this, it means you're facing the same choice I did. But you're stronger than I was. You'll make the right decision. The storage unit filled with police and paramedics. As they loaded my mother onto a stretcher, she grabbed my hand. I'm sorry, she said. For everything. For not being strong enough to end this years ago. I squeezed her hand, watching Leo's still form being covered with a sheet. It's ended now. Aunt Marge wrapped an arm around me as the paramedics wheeled my mother away. David would be proud, she said softly. You finished what he started. I looked down at the letter in my hands, thinking of choices and consequences, of strength and weakness, of the thin line between justice and revenge. No, I said. We all did. Six months later, I stood in front of the renovated Moonlight Cafe, now transformed into a community center. The grand opening banner fluttered in the spring breeze, and Aunt Marge squeezed my hand as we watched families stream inside. David would have loved this, she said softly. My mother approached slowly, still walking with a slight limp. Her designer clothes were gone, replaced by simple jeans and a sweater. The art therapy program starts next week, she said. We already have ten teens signed up. The irony wasn't lost on any of us, turning Leo's hub of manipulation into a safe haven for vulnerable youth. Sometimes the best revenge is healing what your enemy tried to destroy. Dad called again. I told them, watching their reactions carefully. Wants to me explain his side of things. What are you going to do? My mother asked, her voice careful, neutral. I pulled an envelope from my bag, the last piece of David's legacy found buried in one of his boxes. I think I'll send him this instead. Inside was a photo of my father with Leo, dated years before I was born, both men smiling over signed documents. On the back, David had written, the beginning of everything. Remember who chose this path. Are you sure? Marge asked. Some doors are hard to close once they're opened. Some doors shouldn't stay closed, I replied, thinking of all the secrets that had poisoned our family. Besides, he deserves to know why I'm choosing to stay here. My mother flinched slightly at that, but didn't argue. We'd spent months rebuilding our relationship learning to talk without hiding behind perfect facades and practice lies. It wasn't always pretty, but it was real. Tessa emerged from the center, grinning. 
You guys have to see this, the kids are already filling up the suggestion box. Someone even asked if we could start a creative writing program. For processing trauma through storytelling, my mother mused. That's actually brilliant. Speaking of storytelling, Marge pulled something from her purse, a worn journal with David's name on the cover. I think it's time for this to have a new home. I stared at it. But that's... The journal that started everything? Yes. She pressed it into my hands. But look at the blank pages in the back. They're waiting for a new story. Your story. As if on cue, a group of teenagers walked past, laughing and pushing each other playfully. They reminded me of David's photo, of how young and full of hope he'd been before everything went wrong. Maybe some stories don't need endings, I said, running my fingers over the journal's worn cover. Maybe they just need new beginnings. My mother touched my shoulder, a gesture that once would have felt foreign but now carried the weight of everything we'd survived together. New beginnings require letting go of old endings. I nodded, thinking of the letter I'd written to my father, still unsent. I forgive you, but I don't need you. I found my family in the truth, not in comfortable lies. Inside the center, someone started playing piano halting, beautiful notes floating through the open doors. Life finding its way through the cracks of what was broken. Ready, Tessa called from the entrance. The writing workshop's about to start. I looked at these women, my aunt who kept faith, my friend who kept secrets, my mother who kept trying, and felt something settle in my chest. Not peace exactly, but purpose. Actually, I said, I think I'm ready to tell my own story. As we walked inside together, I caught a glimpse of our reflection in the window for women, all carrying different pieces of the same broken history but moving forward anyway. Behind us, David's journal waited in my bag, its blank pages promising something I'd never understood until now. Sometimes the best revenge isn't about making others pay for the past. Sometimes it's about refusing to let that past define your future. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you find the family you need in the aftermath of losing the one you thought you wanted.